you'll leave out that way. The next panel is Nisha Brody, Karen Rankin, Kimberly Senlov, Andrea Hughes, Mary Brichard, Amy Deep. The panel following that panel will be Paul Brochard. Brochard. Ray Ann Bradford, Terry Williams, Juliana Terry Torgerson, Torgerson, Casey Whalen, and Dr. Latina Baello. Right. Nisha Rohde? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Thank you, Senators. Um, I would like to thank you all for hearing our voices as conservatives. We are drowned out by the media today here in these chambers, not here in these chambers, I'm sorry, out in the return, our voices were drowned out as if we have no right to speak. I want to thank you for this atmosphere. You have heard us. Conservatives are a huge portion of Texans. Um, there are liberal Texans, but, but our voices deserve to be heard too, and we did vote for our representatives, and you've represented us well with this bill. It is a common sense bill. The baby matters. They are part of this equation. Mothers matter. This bill is about their health. This bill is about improving the standard of these clinics. They're not going to shut down. They're going to make their money. They will keep operating, but they will operate at a higher standard. We need that. We thank you for representing us. Um, I'm, I'm very hurt by the disrespect that's been shown uh, by people who seem to not be able to hear the conservative voice. The media won't share our voice, but I feel like that you here today have heard us, and you are representing us as conservatives. We want the babies to have some measure of protection. We want you to meet us halfway. 20 weeks is halfway through the pregnancy. This bill makes sense. It is a good bill, and it is about protecting the babies. They are a portion of the equation and it is good for women as well. Thank you. Karen Rankin? Thank you. My name is Karen Rankin, and I wish to state my opposition to Senate Bill 1. I live in Austin, uh, District 14 of Senator Watson's constituents. Uh, thank you, Chairman Nelson, for hearing us today. I waited 11 hours uh, for um, to speak to the House Committee a couple of weeks ago. Never got a chance to speak. I've waited 11 hours today, and I'm glad to finally have a chance. You say, I'm speaking to the conservatives here, you say you want small government, but you want it big enough to intrude on the most personal decisions any woman, any family makes, so I don't believe you. You say you care about life, but Texas just executed the 500th person since 1976, 261 of them with the approval of the current administration. So I don't believe you, Senator Duell. You say you care about women's health, but you have cut funding for scores of clinics which provide the only health care thousands of women will ever receive. So I don't believe you. You say you care about children and mothers, but this bill is likely to cost more lives than it saves. So I don't believe you. You say you care about families, but you make no mention of the father's responsibilities, so I don't believe you. You say you care about children, but there are approximately 40,000 Texas children in and out of foster care, 10,000 of them adoptable, eligible for adoption, so I don't believe you. You say you care about children, but you support a system which leaves over a million children without health care insurance, so I don't believe you. You say you are representing Texans, but you are only representing the most religiously conservative among us, so I don't believe you. You say you're a Christian, as I am, but you ignore Christ's call to feed the hungry and care for the poor, to care for the least among us, so I don't believe you. I would very much like a state government that I can believe in, but all I see from our current government is hypocrisy. Thank you. Kimberly Stendlove. My name is Kim Stenlove, and I am here in behalf of SB, support of SB1. We must require any facility that performs invasive medical procedures carrying the risk of hemorrhage, infection, and death to adhere to the same standards as all other surgical facilities. The protection of women cannot be left in the hands of unregulated abortionists. 
My testimony begins with my great aunt, Annie Reeb, who at age 25 became pregnant out of wedlock and died from the infection resulting from an illegal abortion in the 1930s. Forward to 1942, my married grandmother became pregnant with her third child in as many years. My infuriated grandfather insisted she abort. Forward again, 1968. My 23-year-old unmarried mother became pregnant during her adulterous affair with my father. Consumed with guilt, terrified of exposure, and her father's fury, she too chose abortion. Finally, to me, I got pregnant in 1987 at age 16. My mother gave me a choice, either murder my baby and move with my family or remain behind, drop out of school, and ruin my life. Those were her words. From my perspective, my choice was really no choice at all. The day of the procedure, I told her I didn't want to go through with it, but she escorted me into Planned Parenthood anyway. In the waiting room, I was so hysterical, the receptionist threatened to make us leave if she could not calm me down. Instead, we were moved to another room. It was quite clear to everyone in that clinic that I was being coerced, and yet no one intervened. When the doctor began the procedure, I said again that I did not want to do it. He continued without pause and at one point scolded me to stop crying. They never told me of the risks of hemorrhage or infection until the recovery room after it was over. Abortion does not protect anyone. It only destroys. It snuffed out the life of my great aunt. It added only bitterness and unforgiveness to my grandparents' marriage. It did not erase my father's infidelity, save his first marriage, nor his second marriage to my mother. My abortion was the first legal one, and it was even covered by insurance. But in no way was I protected by it or the people who performed it. I still dropped out of school, left home at 17, married and divorced the father. For six years, I struggled with depression, nightmares, and suicidal thoughts. It is truly only by the grace of God that I stand before you today. Andrea Hughes. <coughs> My name is Andrea Hughes and I oppose SB1. I'm from Austin, Texas. I'm a constituent of Senator Schwetner of District 5. Law is a blunt instrument. It draws hard lines. It doesn't deal well with the complex, difficult, agonizing, and incredibly personal situations that women might find themselves in. As De Justice Douglas wrote in Griswold versus Connecticut, those moments occur within the sacred precincts of our lives, places the state was simply not meant to go. When I met the biological father of my son, I was in a bad place, and he took advantage of that vulnerability. He coerced and manipulated me into having sex, raping me in all but the strictest sense of the word. I found out I was pregnant when I went in for assistance with a UTI at age 20. I was terrified and devastated. Abstinence-only education had taught me that I was impure and made me feel like I was worthless. I had no home, no means, and no support after the father vanished. Luckily, my mother came to our rescue financially, and she supported me emotionally through the very difficult pregnancy. She also watched my son when I couldn't afford childcare. Without her, I wouldn't have had any chance to succeed. I appreciate the fact that I had a choice of whether or not to continue the pregnancy, especially given the terrible circumstances. I am glad that I had the freedom to embrace the beautiful choice of life. However, no woman should be forced to face the enduring physical and emotional ramifications of pregnancy. Today, my son is 10, and I'm still experiencing them. Pregnancy and subsequently becoming a mother is one of the most physically and emotionally demanding jobs in the world and not something to undertake lightly. Every child should be a wanted child and no woman should be, feel forced to give birth simply because she lives nine hours away from some place that could help her. By putting this bill into effect, 37 clinics will be closed unless they can reach the standards of an ambulatory surgical center for a process as simple as taking a pill in many cases and will have a negative impact on the impoverished, on those who cannot afford the time off, child care, travel, and lodgings to go from El Paso to Austin. I think we can all agree that abortion is a horrible thing, and it is something no one ever wants to need to have. Let's work instead to comprehensively educate every sexually active adult about birth control. Let's work to provide better health care options and easy access to low-cost birth, low birth control. This approach will prevent abortions too, but without blunt interference in a woman's Your life. time is up. I just have Mary, half a sentence, I'm ma sorry. Mary Burchard. Chairwoman Nielsen and members of the committee, thank you for giving us all the opportunity to speak and be exercise our right to citizens to speak. Thank you. My name is Mary Borchard, and I represent myself, and I'm represented by Senator Estes, and I am for Senate Bill 1. Um, I answer a helpline for women suffering emotionally after undergoing abortion. I volunteer on a retreat that helps women heal from the emotional and spiritual pain of abortion. I see their tears and hear their cries. Mothers who lose children suffer from this loss. Not all women are immediately affected by the abortions and loss of their child. Some calls I receive are women who no longer can push down the pain. 
It's just too great an effort to continually suppress this pain. Sometimes they react in anger, but when they finally are able to make, have the courage to make the call, sometimes it's 20 years after the abortion before they have the courage to get help. It's because of these women and their ch missing children that I am speaking up. They know that terminating a pregnancy is not just terminating a pregnancy, it's terminating a child, their child. Many of these women speak about coerced abortions and pressure they feel from their parents, friends, spouses, boyfriends, and others to abort their children. If abortion were banned after 20 weeks, at least at this point, perhaps pressure to abort would subside. And knowing that their children feel pain at 20 weeks only adds to their sadness. Please help these mother and their children. Also, it's been said that only five abortion centers in Texas would remain open if this bill is passed. It's outrageous to me to think that only five abortion centers meet the standards of an ambulatory surgery center as is needed for all other day surgeries. As saying they say this is a simple procedure, but complications, some people were asking, well, the complications, there's none reported. Well, those who have, have been testifying all day long have been reporting complications, and none of those are on that list of complications. Um, time's up, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Amy D. Thank you, Chair and Committee. My name is Amy Dietz. I live in Austin, and I'm a proud constituent of Senator Kirk Watson. Um, I'm opposed to Senate Bill 1 because I believe that this bill as written is the wrong way to achieve the goal of protecting women's health. It would instead take away important health care services for many Texas women while offering nothing to replace these services. Regardless of what supporters of this legislation may choose to call me or those who share my opposition to this bill, I don't think that anyone is pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. The goal of reducing the overall number of abortions in Texas is something I think both sides can support, but only if that is accomplished through comprehensive preventative measures that in no way restrict women's choices or constitutional rights. I cannot understand why legislators who claim to be champions of women's health and well-being refuse to consider measures that could actually improve women's health and well-being such as Medicaid expansion and fact-based sex education programs in our schools with the goal of reducing unplanned pregnancies. Cutting off access to safe and legal abortions for a significant percentage of Texas women will not prevent abortions and will instead cause more women to seek illegal and potentially unsafe abortions out of financial necessity. Additionally, this bill would close health care clinics that women in many parts of Texas rely on for services that have nothing to do with abortion, including r routine preventative health care, screenings for cervical, ovarian, and breast cancer, contraception and family planning services, and prenatal care for pregnant women. For many women who cannot afford health insurance and or live in rural areas with very few health care providers, the same clinics that this bill would close down are the only option for crucial health care services. I'm not asking or expecting you to agree with all of my positions. What I am asking for is open, honest, thorough, and fair dialogue on this bill. I hope it is not too much to expect. Thank you, ma'am. 